Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So this week's episode of Doctor Who totally melted my face off. It's gonna go down as like one of the best in series eight, as well as like one of the best scary fun episodes overall. Just like normal, I'm gonna do my top five moments, then list all the really important references and takeaways I could find, and then do my review. And hello to any new people. If you're just finding me for the first time, I do weekly Doctor Who videos. I even do a weekly giveaway. All you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video. On to important stuff. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. I'll wait just a sec. Okay, ready? Here we go. Top five moments. Number five, Clara and Danny Pink's dinner date. It was a nice reversal on the first time they met, only this time we were seeing it unfold from Clara's perspective, and we got to see her apartment. Does anyone else get the sense that Moffat is trying to play a game and see how many funny places he could park the TARDIS in Series 8? Capaldi totally one-upped himself by parking it in her bedroom. The kitchen was funny, but the bedroom was better, especially him looking into Clara's vanity mirror. That's like a whole other conversation we could have about that. What was he thinking about while he was waiting for her to come back? I got this vibe from the first episode, whenever he was talking to the robot about forgetting who he was, you know, all about identity. And there was just so much going on during that dinner date. I just love the pacing. Samuel Anderson turning on a dime, the way he reacted to the war killings, I totally expect that to be paid off in a later episode. And then we have to think about the wells. I feel like there's an importance in that 23 number. I've been telling everyone to look at the planets in the opening title sequence. There is the one that looks just like Gallifrey or post-war Trenzalore, but in terms of quantity, there are about 27 planets, which is the same number that Davros and the Daleks hid in the Medusa Cascade. I don't think there's any kind of connection between Davros's planets and Danny Pink's wells, but I do think it's an interesting coincidence. There was this moment when they paid off the date later, you know, in the end when Clara basically went back. She commented on the laws of time. I took it as a subtle dig at the classic doctors being scolded by the Time Lords, but I do wonder, what are the actual laws of time? If you can remember any old episodes or anything from the classic doctors runs where they quote laws of time, just let us know in the comments below. But on to number four, Dan the Soldier Man. This was so trippy. Try not to overthink it too much, but this is where my mind went. Young Rupert is obsessed with the story he's created for his army figure, Dan the Soldier Man. Then, because of the courage Clara gives him in the Doctor's fantasy dream, he's inceptioned into joining the real-life army one day so that he can learn to be a hero. In order to reaffirm that, he changes his name to that of his childhood hero, and he becomes Danny Pink. Later, the war takes its toll, and we meet him at Coal Hill School afterwards. But let's think about the actual story of Dan the Soldier Man, the story that Rupert created. He was destined to be a leader, but he didn't want to join said army. Cut to Missy collecting souls, or soldiers, or however you want to think about it. Real quick though, to finish this sentence, I'm going to have to talk about potential spoiler stuff, so if you want to, you can just turn the volume down so you see the spoiler tag go away. Okay, ready? Here we go. What if Missy will create an army of Cybermen and try to force Danny to become the leader, and he'll be like the focal point of the Doctor stopping them? Just a new theory I thought of when listening to the Dan the Soldier Man story. Okay, spoiler part over, on to number three, Spaceman Danny Pink. His name is Colonel Orson Pink from 100 years in the future, but there's so much going on here too. I guess our children or grandchildren will be pioneering time travel. 100 years isn't that far away. His whole story though was just like a self-contained thing. I don't think there was anything sinister about Orson, but I do wonder if we'll see him again. I feel like multiple Danny Pinks would be a nice twist on the Impossible Girl storyline. I totally buy the argument that his time capsule malfunctioned and sent him to the end of everything. The Robinson Crusoe metaphor was perfect and it implied that the Doctor will eventually die a final death, like he won't be the last being living in the universe. That is unless he finds a way to exist in the void outside of normal space-time. That's the crazy thing about trying to apply logic to Doctor Who. There's always some timey-wimey workaround that will allow the Doctor to walk away with a few scratches and a new face. I don't think we got an exact date on that end of the universe time, but what Moffat was trying to apply, you know, wasn't that the universe was ending or time was ending. I think he was just trying to say that the universe had reached a point in its expansion when matter had started to drift apart. So planets didn't exist anymore just because they'd been pulled apart. If you've never watched Cosmos, it's on Netflix. Neil deGrasse Tyson talks a lot about what's happening to the universe as time goes on. Its expansion is accelerating, so eventually all galaxies and planets and everything will just drift apart until there's no more gravity to hold everything together. That's like billions of years away though. So Doctor Who science lesson over. You know, essentially at the end of things, that Robinson Crusoe moment was just when all the planets had drifted apart. But on to number two, the shared nightmare and the new monster. 
I love the idea of a universally shared experience tied to a new type of monster. And yes, I do think that the creatures hiding under the beds were a new thing that we haven't seen before. If they'd been in the silence, they would have been way taller. And no, I don't think that Moffat ever intends to show us what they look like. I don't think he even knows what they look like. I think the bed sheet is just meant to represent what each of us pictures when we think about something creeping under the bed. And I did get the sense that they were trying to make a joke on the doctor potentially being that creature. Like, things go missing, strange noises, unexplained things happen, and it's all because the doctor is just jumping around in space-time messing with things. It even got just a little bit creepy until we saw the doctor take that sip of coffee, and you know, then it turned into a joke. I always forget how good the doctor is at pinching stuff. I mean, if he can pinch the moment from underneath the Time Lord's noses, he could probably pinch a cup of coffee. Speaking of Thief, that theme is going to continue into episode 5, which is called Time Heist. But my number one moment, of course, the stopover on Gallifrey. I'll admit I lost a little bit when this happened. I actually thought it was going to be some creepy barn that Clara was forced to sleep in. In case you missed it though, Clara's speech at the end of the episode explained that the barn they were in was the same barn where the John Hurt Doctor took the moment during the 50th anniversary episode. I know there was like a little bit of confusion whenever the 50th happened as to which planet John Hurt was on whenever he was walking through the sand. Everything I've read about this episode says that barn scene was on Gallifrey, so unless something weird was going on, John Hurt was also on Gallifrey during the 50th. I just love how Moffat used the moment to bookend the Doctor's life, you know, tying his greatest atrocity to his deepest nightmare. Time really isn't meant to be a circle, like the scene implied, it's more like a river that forks, but Moffat, who actually did write the episode all by himself, gives us a lot of information about the Doctor's true motivation. He has, at all times, since his first face, as the episode implies, been driven by fear. And now thanks to the courage that Clara gave him, he's used that fear to become the Doctor, to create that persona. We have to remember the Doctor wasn't born with that name, he gave himself the name the Doctor, maybe as a result of what Clara told him. You know, I guess that's what they were trying to imply. I try not to get too tied up in paradoxes in the Doctor's timeline, but I love the thought that Clara is so fundamentally tied to the Doctor's life, like he would not be the Doctor if she had never existed. It makes your head spin a little bit because you wonder, how did things go down the first time? Because Clara did not exist before the Doctor. He presumably found her. Then the Impossible Girl storyline on Trenzalore happened, cut to many Claras over his timeline, then to Child Doctor given courage to join the Time Lord Academy by Clara. I feel like this scene more than any other in Series 8 is something we're going to be talking about for years. But now it's your turn. Let me know in the comments, what was your favorite moment and where do you think this episode ranks in terms of scary Doctor Who episodes? I wouldn't say it's like top five, maybe at least top 20. Here's a couple of the bigger references and takeaways that I noticed, but please add any that you saw in the comments. So first off was the title of the episode, Listen. Reminds you a lot of the other one word Doctor Who episode titles. And the fact that it was a bit horror made me think of Blink. Although I still think that Blink is a scarier episode. And then there's Hi. That was actually Clara's fourth episode during 7B. So we had a one word title for the fourth episode, two series in a row. We'll have to see if that trend continues next year in Series 9. Moving on to daytime, every time I see Clara and Danny paint together, the subject of lady killing comes up. It sounds like they might pay that off in the finale. I mean, I hope they do. Otherwise, why would they bring that up every time they're together? Moving to Frankenstein's laboratory, the telepathic link in the TARDIS, it reminded me of something right out of Frankenstein, especially with the steampunky look of the console and the rest of the room. The new TARDIS is like a lo-fi, sinister-looking Frankenstein laboratory. We can only imagine what kind of creature he's going to create in there. Moving on to the children's home. This was the first time that I've seen Capaldi use psychic paper in series 8. I'm totally glad to see it back. I remember there was an instance where Matt Smith showed off an ID badge and it actually had a picture of the first doctor in it. So now every time whenever the doctor flashes his psychic paper as like an ID, I wonder if it's the first doctor's picture that people are seeing. Here in Rupert or Danny's bedroom, that robot that the doctor's holding looks just like the robot from Tom Baker's first episode. This box of soldiers here too just makes me hallucinate Cybermen. I feel like the story of Dan the Soldier Man is definitely going to be involved in the finale. Here, when they get to the end of everything and the Doctor's going on about silence, it actually made me think of the silence's prophecy. Silence will fall when the first question is asked. Now the creatures were not the silence, but it makes me think that the silence's prophecy might carry forward into Series 8. Overall, I felt like this episode was just the strongest in Series 8. Definitely my new favorite. I give it a solid A+. It didn't linger too long on affectation during the date scene, and because Moffat has this crazy Doctor Who mind palace, and he wrote the episode by himself, the story served as this huge bookend for the Doctor's existence. Think about it this way, Clara helped the Doctor so that he could grow up to become the Doctor, save her so that he could help her help himself. 
I also really love the way that Danny Pink is becoming a part of the team without even knowing it. Like his timeline is now fundamentally linked to Clara and the Doctors. This all feels like set up for a huge Danny Pink moment in the finale. And the idea that fear will take you home feels so much more important now. Like the Doctor's fear, Missy's fear, Clara's fear, and so on will be the connective tissue of Series 8 in general. Behind the scenes, I actually heard there's a lot of drama going on with the Doctor Who production, you know, between the producers and Moffat. And for whatever reason, Moffat is just like dominating Series 8 stories. I don't know if that's true, but I definitely feel like the episodes that are directly connected to the big Missy plot will benefit from Moffat's direct involvement. So with that in mind, here are some of the other episodes Moffat is listed as writer on. There's episode 5, Time Heist, that's next week. Episode 6, The Caretaker, in two weeks. And then there's the final two episodes, 11 and 12, Dark Water and Death in Heaven, respectively. So I'd expect those episodes will directly tie in with the Missy plot. So just to talk about the actors a little bit, I feel like Capaldi was fantastic in this episode. I love watching him lecture himself. Samuel Anderson is starting to come into his own too. I love the alternate version of Danny Pink he created, although technically it was his grandson. But I love the idea of an impossible Danny storyline, just like an impossible Clara storyline. It also kind of makes you wonder if there's going to be some sort of Cyberman tie-in with like Danny Pink Cyberman and Oswin Dalek. They both end up becoming these horrible things in their timeline. Let's not forget that the Doctor's companions usually meet some sort of untimely end. But moving along, my next Doctor Who video is going to be my top five scary episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get that. I'll be posting that tonight and then my Q&A is going to post tomorrow. So be sure to leave all your questions about the stopover on Gallifrey, the Missy plot, anything else you want me to include. I'll announce the giveaway winner whenever I post that Q&A. So lots of stuff coming tonight. You can click here to get the bonus video and click here to get the q and I'll add the annotations as soon as I post those videos. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.